that Elizabeth had a fairly extraordinary capacity to inspire loyalty in the male advisers and ministers who surrounded her, but I think it's a mistake to consider this in terms of some sort of gender dichotomy. Um, so much of, of what we have thought about Elizabeth is, is based upon the idea that she was a woman in a man's world. She wasn't. She was a monarch in a man's world. And a monarch is a very different thing than a woman. It's a, a lovely remark um, um, when Elizabeth was on progress, um, coming back into London after one of her summer visits. Um, she's seen through the, by the crowds in the streets and, and one old lady shouts, What? The Queen is a woman? Um, which sounds ridiculous, but actually um, the old lady is, is completely spot on because in many senses, in the most important senses, the Queen wasn't a woman any more than the King was a man. Um, monarchy, in, in the Renaissance understanding of, of, of the word, to some extent superseded biology. As, as an anointed king or queen, you existed in a capacity of your own. This is, this is quite a difficult thing for our um, gender politics obsessed age to apprehend, but it made complete sense in the Renaissance. Um, so to suggest that Elizabeth's capacity to inspire loyalty was to do with her ability as a woman to play upon the, um, the, the, the feelings of, of her male ministers is, I think, at once inaccurate and unfair. Um, one would never want to be kind about Mrs Thatcher, but similar things were said about her, that basically her cabinet ministers, you know, liked her ankles more than her policies, um, which was rather unkind, e even for Mrs Thatcher. Um, and I, I think a similar thing is, is going on with, with Elizabeth. Mrs Thatcher's hairstyle is quite like Queen Elizabeth's hairstyle. I wonder whether that was ever deliberate. Um, so I think what, what does inspire Elizabeth's ministers is um, a combination of several things. For a start, she is the figurehead of the Protestant Reformation. It is through her very slender physical body that their hopes of reforming the church will stand or fall. Um, Elizabeth's principal ministers were committed reformists, deeply pious men, who'd somehow waited out the, the Marian um, counter-reformation and who believed passionately in the reform of the church. It's a mistake to call it the Protestant Church because it was still an, a nascent uh, evangelical movement rather than Protestantism as we understand it today. Nonetheless, men like Cecil and Walsingham believed very powerfully that they were doing God's work. So Elizabeth was for them not only their, their ruler, um, but also the, the most important hope they had of seeing their religion established as the state religion. Secondly, Elizabeth was very clever when it came to the way she ran her court. She wasn't silly enough to think that a court could manage without women, but she didn't encourage wives, which I think is rather the key to a good dinner party, isn't it? Um, she didn't encourage people to bring their wives to court. She had her pretty ladies-in-waiting um, and occasionally um, visitors who came in the train of ambassadors, such as her very beautiful friend Helena Snackenborg, who came in the suite of the Princess of, of Sweden. So she did like to have pretty girls around to keep things jolly, but she didn't like wives, emotional relationships, family relationships, intruding on the business of her government. I suspect that most of her courtiers quite liked it that way too. Um, I think for them, being able to do business in a very straightforward fashion was rather appealing. I think they liked the fact that the Queen was able to devote herself to them um, almost entirely, that unlike her, her sister or even um, her father, there was really nothing else to distract her attention from them. And then I suppose finally when considering Elizabeth's uh, capacity to attract loyalty, we, we have to think about her extraordinary ability for, for myth-making. Um, again, we, we, we see the Elizabethan court almost as a joke, the idea of these sort of men writing sonnets to a, a raddle old woman um, with too much white paint on her face and pretending to be in love with her. And we can't really understand why, why something that seems so pathetic should, should have been so potent. And that's not really the way to see it. She, she represented something divine for her courtiers, even in, in her old age. And the idea that they served her in this chivalric game of courtly love was something to them which was very, very present. It was very real. In order to understand it, we have to dismiss our own ideas about what that meant and try and look at it freshly through Renaissance eyes. So for Elizabeth, what really inspired loyalty was the divine nature of, of her, her status as a monarch. Um, the fact that she had this extraordinary propaganda cult which grew up around her and of course the fact that she was unmarried.